in the in bots. And yeah, but yeah, we still have to do on Zoom for uh, this time. So before we start, we're going to talk about compassion and reality. So try to generate correct motivation in accordance to those two topics. And basically, it includes the whole path to enlightenment. So you can have a motivation in that direction here yeah, to learn more about these qualities of the mind, so generating compassion and understanding reality, uh, to develop more positive states of mind all the way up to the stage of part of enlightenment. So generate the motivation for yourself. Okay, and then uh, we do a few prayers, right? In the beginning. Yeah, so that means that in front of yourself, you can imagine uh, Sakyamuni Buddha and surrounded by the masters of, of different Buddhist traditions and then surrounding yourself, uh, imagine countless sentient beings and their undergoing individual sufferings and uh, focus upon their suffering, uh, think your responsibility to uh, liberate them. And for that purpose, we're here. For that purpose, we're going to also lead them in the prayers. Yeah? So, Take them to count and we recite the praise together. To the founder, the untranscend and destroyer, the one gone beyond, the full destroyer, the complete, perfect, full awakened being, perfect in knowledge and good conduct, the guardian of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the complete, full awakened one, the now transcend and destroyer, the glorious conqueror, subdue from the sacrifice, the straight of the sacrifice. To the founder, the untranscend and destroyer, the one gone beyond, the full destroyer, the complete, perfect, full awakened being. Both your knowledge and your good conduct, so God and all the world, serene guide of human beings to retain it, teacher of God's human beings, to you to complete for the awakening, the don't transcend and destroy, the glorious conquerors, so beautiful and psychic, the so the founder don't transcend and destroy, the one gone beyond, so the full destroyer, the complete perfect for the awakening being, both your knowledge and good conduct, so God and all the world, serene guide of human beings to retain it, teacher of God's human beings, to you to complete for the awakening one. The down trends and destroy the glorious conquerors, subdue from the sucking, the straightening of stock records. When you're supreme amongst humans, you were born on this earth, you played out with seven strides, and then said, I'm supreme in this world. Pure, wise, and a prostrate. With pure bodies, form supreme and pure, with an ocean like a golden mountain. Please, playing and blazes in the three worlds, win of the best road to your prostrate. The supreme science, placed like a spotless moon, color like gold, and prostrate. Thus, three like you, the three worlds are not incomparable, wise, and to your prostrate. Say we have a great compassion, the founding of no understanding, a field of merit that falls like a vast ocean, for you the one comes to dust and straight. The purity that frees from attachment, the virtue that frees from the lower realms, the one part by pure reality, the Dharma that pacifies our prospect. Those who are liberated and show the part of liberation, the holy field qualified realizations, were devoted to the moral precepts, to you sublime community and virtue are prostrate. How much to the Supreme Buddha, how much to the Dharma refuge, how much to the great science? So all three have devoted homage to all body of respects, around your bodies, as men, and all aspects, with supreme faith to pay homage. Do not commit any non virtuous actions, perform only perfect virtuous actions. Subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the Buddha. A star, a vibration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a dream, a flash of lightning, and clouds, seek on distant things as such. For this merits, may all sins your beings attain the rank of all scenes, the beautiful falls, and the, the sun ocean, heard by the waves, aging, sickness, and death. I prostrated our uh, triple gem. This I heard one time. The Bhagwan was dwelling in the mass, which is Mount Rajgir, together with the great community of monks and the great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagwan was absorbed in concentration, categorized from the top of section. Also, at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Abhutiswara looked upon the very practice of found factional wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also in the Then, to the power of the Buddha, the Vedvishara Kutra says to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Abhutiswara, how should any son of the lineage who wish to train, who wish to practice activities of found factions? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Abhilisvara said this to the Venma Shariputra. Shariputra, the son of the lineage, a daughter of the lineage, to practice activities of found faction of wisdom. So look upon it like this. For I claim repeating those five parts was empty in nature. Form is empty, emptiness form, empty is not than form, and form is not than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, consciousness factors, and consciousness not. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena and things throughout the unproduced, unseen, not. Shariputra, therefore, and emptiness is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no position, no practice, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visible form, no sound, no order, no taste, no object of touch. 
There's no element up to including no mind element in the mental conscious element. There's no ignorance and extinction of ignorance and so on up to the agent and death of such agent. Similarly, there's no suffering or generation of states and parts. There's no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, attainment for the sattvas will lie in twelve perfections. Mind without obscuration, doubt, guilt. Heaven completes past beyond error, if it's the end point of nirvana. And all the Buddhas will dwell in three times, also manifest completely, perfectly completely, no lies in the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, is part of the mantra equal to equal, the mantra truly pacified all suffering to be known as truth, sense not false. The mantra of perfection of wisdom is declared by the Gadagat, Paragat, and Parasampat, the Bodhisattva. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, and Asatva should train the mantra of perfection of wisdom. Then the Bhagavan arose from the concentration, commanded the Bodhisattva, and Asatva, I, the Bodhisattva. Well said, well said. Some of the lineage it is like that. It is like that. Once you practice the wisdom, just that indicated to me that it has to rejoice. But one having just spoken, the Venmachar and Kutra, Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya of Visvara, those down time, along with the words of God's humans as soon as God was overjoyed and highly responsible to spoken. Go straight to the gathering of the kings of the three chakras, who buy the holy years in human space. At the power of clear points in the illumination, look at the protection like mother for a child. Look at somebody says, "No, somebody is not coming." Look at somebody says, "No, somebody is not coming." Look at somebody says, the teachings of the three sublime jewels possess the power of truth. They end our dreams to be transformed, may they be skulls, and may they be pacified. May only the four supposed to be completely pacified, and may the host of 80,000 objects be pacified. May we be separated from problems and how we condition to the Dharma. And may all enjoyments be going to the Dharma, and may they be a spacious and perfect life here in right now. Foundation of all good qualities is the kind of perfect free duty. Directly devoting to him is the root of the parts. By clean seeing this and applying great effort, Please bless me to rely on in great respect. Understanding and present freedom of this rebirth is found only once. It's greatly meaningful and difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the minds and see me day and night take the lessons. This life is impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly the gates and death comes. After death, so the shadow falls the body to reach the black and white drama folly. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativity on this old virtuous deeds. Seeking some side pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain, can be relied upon. Recognize these shortcomings, please bless me to generate a strong wish for the blessed liberation. Led by the spirit of mindfulness, alertness, and great caution. The root of the teachings is keeping the grudging of Chanavas. Please bless me to accomplish the essential practice. To serve fallen, to deceive some sadness of all modern migratory beings. Please bless me to see this and train the Supreme Bodhicitta and be responsibility of being migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta and do not practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva of our greater. Once I specify destruction to all objects and correctly analyze the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate and quickly my mind stream, the unified part of common body and special insight. Have become a pure vessel by training in the general part. Please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme bunch of equal. At a time, the ways of accomplishing the two things is keeping pure vows and samaya. As one firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and just like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Pajayana, by practicing with great energy, never given one before sessions, please bless me to realize the teaching of the Holy Father. Like that, may the Guru to show the noble parts and spiritual friends who practice the long vows. Please bless me to pacify completely our emotions. In all my lives, there are several perfect Gurus. May join me in the Nixon Dharma. May complete the quality of stages in the past. May I quickly take the state. What is that? Tara. Padi Sangye Jedu Mende Wahaji Joyuna Daje Jebajon
idam guru jana kam ne yata ya mi sange chudam suni san janju bado dani jazu ji dahi chisu yebe sana chola penje sange do ba jo sange chuda janju bado dani jazu ji dahi chisu yebe sana chola penje sange do ba jo sange chuda sange san Tanjo Bado Dani Gazo to Dagi Chiju Kibutsu. Dola Penshe Sangye do Bajo Nanaka. Kangi to the Nizu Tava Tanji Pamachiri. Dumba to New Tinsuva put on Dela Chatsen. Yeah, so maybe start with a quotation of uh, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Arya Nagajuna. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, a quotation of, of one particular text, and that is Gyanju uh, Samjel or commentary on Bodhicitta. And then uh, it says, when emptiness is explained, or reality, so to say, yeah, we talk about compassion and reality. So, when reality is being explained and understood and meditated upon, yeah, then there's no doubt. Uh, in the person who, who understands it, meditates upon, there's no doubt that uh, the mind that wishes uh, others' welfare will arise. It's very interesting uh, because we're going to talk about compassion as well as um, reality, and it's related, right? Because if you understand reality well, then compassion becomes stronger. So that's from the Buddhist point of view, quite quite a lot of you know, Quite a lot of quotations and, and reasoning are, are there to, to, to prove that. Why is that so? Because if you understand the ultimate nature of reality, then you also know there is not really a um, concrete self, so to say. So often when we engage in, in our daily lives and we get angry or strong desire rises or, or fear or excitement or anxiety or whatsoever. So what disturbs our mind, so to say, those states of mind, they rooted in the kind of concept of I am mine and the concept of uh, that feels more self-importance. So this kind of aspect of, of self-identity or self-importance is actually a cause for problems. And that's not only a Buddhist thing, also in many levels of, of psychiatry, that they don't talk about it too much, but there is some interesting research being done about uh, this this kind of self-concern. People with more inclination of, of, of motivation for themselves, you know, narcissists, so to say. Uh, person who is a narcissist, basically that person, uh, their mind is often very disturbed. And it's very interesting that this aspect of, of, of self-concern has been examined in, in types of research in Harvard Medical School, for example. Then Brown did a lot of research regarding the, the, the drawbacks of, 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 you know, of this self-concern. And if you read, for example, uh, Venerable Mathieu Ricard's uh, book on altruism, with this kind of distic, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting to see the benefits of an altruistic intention versus uh, self-concern. So there's a lot of scientific backup proving uh, the benefits of, of thinking about others and, and, and compassion training. Say. So they are related with each other. And, and that goes even all the way up to the CIA. The Pentagon in, in the US, for example, they had this person called Jared. Uh, Something. Anyway, he passed away during, unfortunately during the pandemic, COVID, but he was quite old in his 80s, I think. Um, and he did a lot of research for the CIA uh, examining world leaders. So he was a kind of psych psychologist and he was uh, a profiler. He, he, he wrote down profiles of people like bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, and, 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 and Stephen King. From, Korea. So a lot of world leaders he analyzed in the sense of uh, how will they react if you take a political kind of action. 
<laughs> it's very interesting. So that means what the mind actually tells us, uh, you know, we act in a particular way. And some people with a lot of strong emotional life is very predictable. People are very predictable. Uh, so that means that people were very, you know, self-centered. And Saddam Hussein, for example, was one of those persons who classified as a real narcissist, kind of very self-centered and of course problems. And um, that is true all the way up to, to the level of world leaders being been examined and being accepted. That people who have a lot of self-concern actually causes problems. Mm -hmm. So in the Buddha said the cause for all our problems is the self cherishing attitude. So it's kind of very similar that the Buddha came to this conclusion that the more you think about yourself, the more suffering will uh, appear. And why is it so? That's kind of a question. So because if there's more self-concern, then there's more stronger emotional life and then emotional life in the context of destructive emotions. And people, you can, yeah, you can sometimes from a subjective point of view also see when you talk with people um, who always talk about themselves, me, myself, and I, that yeah, there's there's emotional life is much stronger, and, and, and emotions like especially like attachment and, and, and desire and, and anger, for example, irritation, stop. So that means that um, having more self concern and more self interest causes the mind to be disturbed. So the first compassion is a mind that thinks about others. Yeah, there's also a lot of scientific backup about compassion training. That's why it's very popular these days. I mean, not popular enough, but <laughs> it's getting more popular in, in various universities, especially in the US and some interesting pilot projects uh, going on that this compassion training actually brings great benefit. And this compassion training brings great benefits. And why is it so? It's kind of, we say in science, it brings benefits. And it's been proven, but there's a reason for that, yeah, that it's brings a kind of uh, benefits. So the reason for that is that it opposes self-concern. It opposes kind of self-cherishing thought. If you think about others more than yourself, then it opposes kind of this, this thought. And we know from a subjective point of view, if you're very much thinking about your own, you know, it's, yeah, it's very evident. Especially when you're young, now you're old, <laughs> whenever there's an opportunity for. I remember when I was young and fighting over, over when there was not fighting, but have, the, my mother sometimes she was not the best cook on, she's not the best cook on the planet, but sometimes she, <laughs> she made some nice food. Then the last piece, you know, you, you with your brother, you have an argument over that. <laughs> which is just a piece of food that just kind of gives you temporary happiness for a few seconds. Right. <laughs> you get uh, you get uh, sometimes annoyed over that you know, when you, you don't really understand the reality as such. So that means that uh, at that time you can see it's a cause for suffering, mental disturbance and and, and, and uncomfortable feeling and, and yeah, well energy changes, right? So, and that goes all the way up to people wanting power and security and, and those aspects in life, it causes even world problems. Yeah, in world problems in society and on all different levels. It means that if you have the self cherishing attitude, it's kind of a problem. And the self cherishing attitude is rooted in a kind of understanding or thinking there's a kind of I and me and myself and your concrete I. Yeah, so, the question is, uh, does that exist the way it appears? That's a big question. And, and we, from many angles in Buddhist uh, philosophy, we talk about aspects of reality, you know, and those aspects of reality help us to understand our mind. Because whatever appears, well, our mind is not always reality, for example, the dream example. So that means this self centeredness is rooted in a kind of concern about an I. Yeah, so where is this I is a question. Does that I exist is a question. Um, many philosophers, they have questioned this. David Hume, for example, also questioned it. So David Hume, very interesting, very intelligent person, probably, because in his early 20s, right, I think he wrote this book, The Nature of Humankind. 
You know? So uh, that in that book, actually there's one chapter called The Identity of the Self, which is very interesting. I mean, very interesting. Many things are very interesting, but for a Buddhist, it's, it's, it's very interesting because where he talks about, at that time, uh, he talks about, very interesting. He says, very subjective. He says, you know, I cannot talk for everybody. But if I look, it looks like there is an eye appearing. I don't know if it's true for everybody, but in my mind it's like that. And then I look for it, I cannot really find it. <laughs> it's very interesting comment. You know? David Bohm, who was into quantum mechanics, a completely different field than philosophy, he comes to a similar conclusion that examining the reality as in quantum mechanics, he says the self-deceptive thought or the self-identity we have that causes us to uh, want to have power, want to have security, uh, you know, it's us and them, it makes a distinction. So the self-deceptive thought actually is just a show, he says. It's not really there. But a very convincing show, and that's why people take him as an apparent reality. It's literally what he says. It's very interesting. Because it looks like a very convincing show. That's why most of us believe there's an eye. <laughs> but if you analyze, it's not really, really there the way it appears. So we know whatever appears to our mind is not always reality. Our dream, for example, or, or simple things of, 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 of eye diseases or. or you know, sometimes when we get angry or strong desire that arises to the mind, then uh, what appears to your mind at that time is, is just based upon your understanding. Right? What we call a person nice, somebody else might call that person not nice. Then you can do um, like or dislike. It's very popular these days in many forms of, of, of the news or social media. You can give your comment, and you, the easiest way to comment is like or dislike or dislike, right? Let's do right, like, dislike, no, to, yeah, yeah, I think so, no? So, no, like and dislike, I think, yeah. So there's a thumb up and a thumb down. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can see the numbers sometimes um, that, you know, <laughs> some up more numbers is good. It's a very good comment that person gave. Many numbers down. Then it's a bad comment. And that was okay. <laughs> so we very our mind is very constructed in that way, and that's why uh, many people they react so like up or down. But, yeah. So that means that what appears to us at that time we we judge right. It's either good or bad, or we make a kind of uh, yeah opinion there. So that means that whatever appears to you. The person we like, but you sometimes see, right? The, the thumb, thumbs ups and the thumbs down. In India, actually, there's a Coca -Cola, not Coca Cola, a cola company, and that, uh, that, uh, his, that the, the name of the cola, cola company is called Thumbs Up. <laughs> there's one mountain close to Pune, this one big city in south southern part of India, and there's one mountain rock. It's like almost like a thumb. You come by by the train. train. It's a, a very uncommon taste, thumbs up cola, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the Coca Cola and Pepsi they tried to go underneath the price one day uh, to get the market, but they couldn't <laughs> because people still like a thumbs up. It's very Indian, so then they just bought the whole company, and uh, only the same mark thumbs up. They still sell the same product. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so that means that if you if you choose for thumbs up. You cannot choose for thumbs down, right? I think most of that get in social media. You, you either one or the other, you see? So that is our perception. But sometimes we like and somebody else dislikes, you know? And then you can see that it's just our perception. It doesn't have to be reality. So that means a person you like can be disliked by somebody else. So that person, well, person A, right, is not from its own side existing like or dislike. Yeah, it's not from its own side existing friend or enemy. It's just what we call a friend and what somebody else calls enemy. But that person is the same. Right? So that means that we look at the positive side, so we see friend. Somebody else looks at the negative side, says enemy or dislike. So that's 
uh, of course, there are opinions, but uh, opinions are rooted in, in how we look at things. So with, with anger, we overestimate the faults, as we know. With attachment, we overestimate the qualities, and then we believe them to be reality. And that's why anger causes aversion, because if you only think about the faults of others without thinking about qualities, then, of course, you want to be separated from that person situation because there's a feeling of dislike. Yeah? And we don't like suffering, and we like happiness. That's the nature of our human, human uh, existence, that we want happiness, not suffering. So that means that when there's some dislike, we, we react. And, and kind of a version arises. When there's like, we like, and we get attached. And then we overestimate the qualities, and then we expect more of the object than the object actually has. And when we meet the object, there's no satisfaction. So that means that there is, in both ways, a kind of a mind that is not going through reality, because we overestimate either the faults or the qualities mm -hmm. with anger and attachment. So taking that into account, then you see already very simple states of mind. It's not in accordance with reality, but we believe it's in accordance with reality and it causes a problem. Yeah. So the person we dislike because we mentally fabricate a particular idea or, or image of that person. So, and we don't like to hear the qualities. Even if our friends tell us, no, come on, this person is not that bad after all. Maybe it's misunderstood, or, you know. Then you said, no, no, not true. And you believe your anger versus reality or somebody else, you know, can be an all-knowing person and you, you don't believe that. And so that means that we, these emotions, destructive emotions, they're very sneaky. They make us believe they are right. But if they're right or not, this question. And so that's all forms of mind or states of mind that are not in concert with reality, that we, you know, and we examine them, and we see they're not in concert reality. It's very interesting because most of these states of mind, they make us believe they're right. Well, they're not. It's true with judgment, it's true with anger, it's true with, with anxiety, fear, depression, many of those states of mind, they make us believe something. And that reality that appears is not really out there again. Yeah, we, we create our own reality. Yeah, we know if you sit on a nice sunny, sunny day with some little bit of light rain and rainbows and, and summer sets in a very nice area. It's, you know, because you have some, yeah, some nice days there and sometimes rain, right? So, so I remember, it was two years ago, I think. So then uh, there was a beautiful rainbow because it was a little bit of sun and a very nice area with the hills. You know? So yeah, a beautiful rainbow. So if you sit there, and we think, oh, nice. But if you sit there with the glasses of depression, then it's not that nice. Right? So it's, oh, rain, <laughs> or something like that. So that means that if you have two individuals observing the same kind of uh, nature, one person can really enjoy it and the other person can feel terrible. Yeah? So that means the nature out there is, is the same out there, right? But the two different individuals see that nature completely different. One enjoys it, another person, you know, <laughs> is not, not happy with it. Because if your mind is a little bit triggered in negativity, it triggers itself negativity. That's the power of habituation. We often talk about potentials in the mind that, that get activated, you know, potentials in our mind that activate. So the more negative thoughts that come to mind, the more uh, all the negative states of mind gets activated and becomes a kind of a snowball effect or this kind of loop yeah so you have to break out that loop to see reality so we, if you have a loop or a kind of emotional hijack of something like that then when we're able to jump out of it then we look back and think oh, yeah we do like this and we are stupid but if somebody is really wrong we do like Chikari. Tibetan say Chikari. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. But you can do to yourself, right? When, when you get out of a kind of a negative state sometime, then you look back and you say, yeah, that, was, that, that happened, you know? So you realize yourself the mistake sometimes. Some people, they never realize it, but sometimes we can be aware of it, you know? And that's a big, big point because then you see, oh, look at this. 
I believed his affliction before, you know, and then and so when you're in that strain, you know, when this emotional hijack, you believe it's completely true. What comes to mind at that time? You believe this affliction. But when you get out of that strain and look back and say, oh, that's just an appearance, it's not reality, you know, then you can learn a lot from the process. So many, you can see many aspects of our mind, what appears is not always reality, and many aspects of destructive emotions, they make us believe that they are right. And ignorance, same thing. The mind that thinks they are the concrete I also makes us believe this ignorance is right and everything else is wrong. And that's why sometimes when you start talking about emptiness and people fall asleep or walk away or, or don't show interest because what happens is this ignorance is very strong. The habituation is very strong and that prevents us from taking it. You know, same as ignorance wants us to believe ignorance is right. Anger, when it's strong, it wants us to believe anger is right. That's why many people go, oh, you have to get angry to be justified. You look in the news and that's what it is, right? I'm, I'm so angry about this. Yeah. <laughs> this, this. Of course, people are not happy with something, but anger doesn't solve the problem. That's, that's the issue, right? So anger actually overestimates the faults and then the sneaky aspect of anger comes and then lets us believe that anger is right. And everything is wrong, you know? So that, that causes us to suffer because that's not going to reality. So ignorance, same thing. This we talked about this kind of self-concern yeah, we have or self-cherishing thought that is also based on the kind of idea of an I that exists from its own side. Mm -hmm. So this I that exists from its own side causes all these afflictions to arise because it's always kind of how dare this person say this to me. I'm not. It's, I never make mistakes. Mistakes are always made by others. So it's a root, rooted in this I. Yeah? Or uh, how dare this person say this to me about my dress? Or how dare this person say this to me about my glasses? How dare this person say this to me about my car, my house? You know? So it's always related with, with the kind of I, so to say, or a possessive aspect of it, of objects. If you, you know, people they dress up and then some people make a comment about the hair or about this set, then people say, Oh, oh there's this, you know. <laughs> so that means it's, it's related, right? This anger in that context is related with, with, with the concern of I. And in a similar way, uh, attachment, same thing, right? I need this now. I told you about the food when my mother made some good food sometimes, but sometimes also she made some food we didn't like. Brussels sprouts, for example, is <laughs> a bit bitter. You know, we didn't like Brussels sprouts. So we tried all kinds of things with bananas and everything, but we still were able to to fizz out <laughs> the Brussels sprouts and <laughs> put them aside. <laughs> but she was convinced that it's very healthy. So there's so iron in there, I didn't believe. You know, so it's very healthy. So one day she was so clever to completely mix them up with something nice, cheesy kind of stuff. So then we didn't know. And then later on, she told us, oh, we put some Brussels sprouts in there. Then we got so angry. <laughs> because she, she treated us in a way that we didn't expect. <laughs> yeah. So you see, that's kind of, it's kind of, yeah, it's, you see the problem, right? It's kind of rooted in, in we don't like this. And if you do something against that, then we don't like it. You know? So it's all rooted in, in this concern of I. In, in mind, right? Yeah. So uh, that's that's what I said. In science, we come to similar conclusions. Although in, in psychotherapy, we don't talk about it much, unfortunately. That's that's psychotherapy is quite new. This, I mean, it doesn't really exist. I think unless the psychotherapist is, is has some idea about these aspects of reality, but often they don't talk about it. But to be honest, it's it's a very healthy way to understand the problem related to this kind of concept of I and mine. Because in Buddhist psychology, we talk about the root of all problems is ignorance. The ignorance is this kind of, yeah, concrete appearance of I and mine. That is the root of all destructive emotions to come about, you know, problems in society, do the same. So it's quite, in, in Buddhist 
practice in philosophy and psychology, it's quite essential to be understood, you know. And if you understand that well, then you will generate more compassion for others, or it's easier to generate compassion for others. If you generate more compassion for others, then the self cherishing attitude also becomes less. If the self cherishing attitude becomes less, then the results of the self cherishing attitude also becomes less. Because if we only think about ourselves, then it's more kind of a narrow-minded, more self-concerned, kind of very disturbed, yeah? and, and no openness to others. So that means people get lonely, you know? So the self-concern is, is kind of a, a cause as well for many problems. Well, if you understand and think about others more than yourself, then it opens up. Like His Holiness Dalai Lama often states that if I think I'm the only Dalai Lama on this planet, then I feel very lonely, he says. But if I think I'm just a human being, like everybody else of these seven billion people, I feel so connected, you see? So that means that this is a very interesting statement that uh, people will often think only about themselves and cause a lot of problems because when we have an issue or a problem, we think that's the biggest problem on the whole planet, on the whole universe. We put ourselves in the center of the universe. Nobody suffers like I am suffering. We think of that. Yeah, we have a problem. Nobody is as bad as, bad as I am. <laughs> the low self esteem puts a little bit on top, and then we end up in a kind of uh, negative thoughts. But our mind by itself is, if you examine the nature of the mind, is actually free of all these afflictions or all these kind of disturbance. Yeah, the mind is like uh, the blue sky, let's say. And that means the clouds are just temporary there. The clouds of the disturbing thoughts, the clouds of the afflictions, the clouds of, of depression, the clouds of those self-esteem, the clouds of anger, attachment, jealousy, pride. They're not a part of the blue sky. They're just temporarily there. You know? So if you understand well that these destructive emotions are not important to reality, you also see that they can be taken away. Yeah? Because if you analyze well, you can counteract them. So we need a kind of counteracting force to do that. Yeah? When we misunderstand reality, uh, like a dream, the only way to solve it is sit down and think, oh, it's just a dream. So that means we use reasoning to counteract the negative thought of the dream uh, that came up in a particular dream. So we need to counteract our negative states of mind with more constructive way of thinking. Yeah? And the constructive way of thinking importance in reality. So yeah, basically comes down to every state of mind that is not important in reality is called problems. So, and all these destructive emotions are not important to reality, and that's why it causes problems, you know. And, yeah, so that means that these destructive emotions, they mentally fabricate a particular reality that is not really there, out there. And that's why we make a distinction between friend, enemy, and stranger. Yeah, because if you look from their side, are human beings wanting happiness? Your dearest friend can turn into an enemy. If you have a good relationship with a person, one day you have some misunderstanding and then things blow up, right? So then your dearest friend becomes your worst enemy at the time. Okay? Or the other way around. You have a person you have very annoyed with, but then it's based on misunderstanding. So you talk about it and then you solve the problem and it becomes your dearest friend. Right? So that's the other way around. So that means it's just our temporary perception that makes a distinction between things in life. It's not only existing with the object as such. That means that we can see that these negative thoughts or these kind of destructive emotions are not important to reality. They make us believe this one aspect. So the more you understand this aspect of reality, it helps us to generate kind of equanimity. Equanimity to all sentient beings or equanimity to the people around you. Right? So if you have strong equanimity, then it's much easier to generate compassion for them. So equanimity is kind of the basis for, for the field. Yeah, if you want to generate a compassion and, and you have a kind of compassion is the seed, as we often indicate, the compassion is the seed, uh, the field is kind of equanimity. Yeah, so if you prepare your mind well with equanimity, seeing that there's no distinction between 
those you like, dislike, and the person you have an indifferent feeling towards too, like a person you see on the street or in public transport, or, you know, the first time you see the person, you say, okay, but you don't have really a feeling of, of like or dislike or concern, because you don't know the person, right? So that means if you analyze that you don't know the person, after some time you, you start to know the person and then you, you can, can become really friends. In India, my two decades, my, half my life almost, <laughs> I spent in India, it's very interesting. If you travel in the train, then they have these very social trains. It means that second class sleeper is the cheapest way to travel. You can travel from Bangalore, it is South India, all the way up to Delhi. It is kind of, I think, 2,000, 2000 kilometers, something like that, for 700 rupees, which is kind of 10 pounds. I don't think I come with 10 pounds from here to Bath. <laughs> yeah. You travel two nights and two days on the train. It's very social. You get your own bed to get with other people in the, in the in the coach. It's very interesting because the first time you look at persons around you, like, you know, how this person is, you know, because you have to sp you spend forty eight hours, or on my records was eighty two hours, two different trains. So, but, so you, yeah, in this train ride you have to yeah forty two, forty eight back to Delhi. So that means that in the beginning you see these people and then, you know, but then you start talking and it's very really interesting. And then you talk, oh, where are you from? Okay, what's your name? Yes, okay, what do you do? And they ask you, and you have very personal questions sometimes. How much do you earn? <laughs> There's no boundaries. Indians are very open, open minded people, you know. And then after five, six questions, then then they ask the question, what is the ultimate nature of reality? How do you see that? And then, <laughs> then you start talking about spirituality before you know it, within minutes. And then the, the boxes come up and there's all the kind of food comes out and, and you know, they made their own, this kind of homemade little bread and then they give all the curries and then you share and then you become best friends. But in the beginning it's like, hmm, you know, you, you're not really sure about this person. But then, because we don't know from facial expressions, we don't know the minds of people. Right? What we only observe is a physical outlook. But we, we don't have, I mean, most of us, I don't know about you, but I don't have key voice in the minds of others. Right? So we don't know the person's character. We only see about them. And then we mentally fabricate, hmm, I don't know about this person. We spent some two or two nights here in the same apartment with this person, but yeah, what how would that person be? You know, the language or not. But then within a few minutes, you talk like they're your best friends, right? So that means it changes. You see, our perception is just often based on misunderstandings, you know. And as we have with strangers like this example, and with people we dislike because we see one aspect of that person we dislike. And then we fabricate more of that, and fabricate more of that, fabricate more of that, and we then everything that appears to mind at that time is actually negative, right? But that's not a reality, you see? So we often make ourselves believe that what appears to our mind is reality. Well, it's not. Yeah, so same with old age and that's you know, so if you always think you will, you know, you will always, I mean, we have this grasp into permanence, right? We never think uh, we're gonna die tonight. Okay? If you go to bed tonight, do you think you wake up tomorrow? Yeah, of course you think like that. <laughs> so in, in, in the Buddhist practice, we often talk about impermanence quite a bit to train our mind that, you know, in the Kadam uh, tradition, they have this wooden uh, ball, see they drink tea, yeah. it's butter tea. When I made butter tea for my parents, the first time they came back to the Netherlands, they told me it's not tea, this is like of soup. <laughs> because it's kind of, you put salt and butter inside, you see. So, uh, and then in Tibet, they put the, the butter they take out of the cup, then, like, yeah. So, because of the rough climate, yeah. And then you don't wash your body for 60 years, and then you come to the plains of India, and then there's a very in interesting fragrance around you. <laughs> so anyway, these 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 masters of, of, of Kadam, very amazing practitioners, you know, they had this wooden cup, you know, for, for the tea, but then in the evening you put upside down, like that. And then with the discriminating factor, I don't know if I can use it tomorrow. You see? 
that's that's how they had this kind of mental factor discrimination that we don't know if we but we always think yeah I, i'll be okay tomorrow and we always think we don't get sick tomorrow and we before the pandemic happened we thought that something like this will never happen to us you know <laughs> and then it happens and then there's a problem because we didn't expect this me same thing and i was in the eastern nepal doing some retreats without internet access within a few weeks the whole world was completely changed when i came to Kathmandu and and try to adjust because my mind didn't like to believe that we are the borders to india was closing in another 24 hours and i had to go back to india to sort out some things in the monastery so my mind was no it was not true i have to go back <laughs> <laughs> you know, so because the books were closed. But as, as far as we so grasp so much to permanence that things are there for granted, well, it's not. And that's why the pandemic for many people was a big challenge. Because even governments, they didn't expect this. They always thought we have everything in complete control. But it's not, you see. So that means that this kind of grasping to permanence is also an aspect of of a reality that's not really there, but we believe it's there. And it goes problem. The so same with dying, or other people dying. You know, if you if you think people will always be with you, then there's a problem when they're not there anymore, right? So that means uh, there's also an aspect of reality. If you don't accept it, then when it meet, when you meet that reality, is a problem. And so I often, uh, yeah, you can see, and that's why now, luckily, we have this kind of developments of the death cafe and those kind of aspects of, of, of talking about that we're going to die. Yeah, because it's true, right? It's the moment our body comes out by the womb of our, our mother, actually the gay starts, disintegration starts the moment you get out of it. Yeah, it looks like you're growing up, but actually it's, it's a decay happening over time. Yeah, we cannot say, when does it start? It started when you were 40 or it started when you were 50 or before or after. It's not like that, you know, it's not like some people say, yeah, everything, let's say everything uh, down the hill after 50 or something. <laughs> I noticed myself after 50 is, is not uh, that like sports or, or running or, or, you know, exercise or frustrations. It's slightly different from when you're 25. <laughs> so that means when you get older and older, it's not gonna get easier and easier. It's actually getting, you know, Worse and worse, right? But we sometimes don't like to believe that that causes a problem. And so, and the same with losing people, if you don't understand that reality, that causes a problem. And so, uh, if you understand that reality, then you can accept. And so, that means that all these destructive emotions or grasping to permanence is not in contrast with reality. And then, when we face reality, it's very difficult to accept it again. So, with grasping to permanence, it's very difficult when we lose a person, when we're not ready, you know, we don't contemplate because that in the permanence is kind of oh, put away. You know, we don't like to look at that. But <laughs> if that putting away is of benefit or not is a question because uh, if you contemplate it, it becomes a part of yourself, right? And then, then it's no big deal, you know. When I was sitting waiting to see country here one day, and there was one, one a relative country outside he was in his mid 90s quite a healthy healthy person and he said he told me oh they didn't call me yet i'm still here <laughs> so they think about going or not going in a very kind of easy way approach when i was with Ian lama Kupa once in in, in Bulgaria sharing the same same room he's mid 80s he also told me one morning he said no doc he said you know last night almost my breath almost stopped you see he said it just have to stop and there you go <laughs> <laughs> but very, in a very relaxed manner, he was talking about it. It's very interesting. So that means that if you understand that reality, there's there's less suffering. You see that? So often people think Buddhists only talk about suffering and death. They must be so depressed. But I think it's the opposite because you understand that reality. I often tell the story about my own mother whose son is walking around in ropes and and because his, her son is not completely crazy, she knows that. So <laughs> her son did this for a particular purpose, right? So then she started reading the books about his holiness and all the aspects of Lamrim. And then when my father passed away very suddenly, then she could deal with it so well. So she didn't, she was sad, but didn't go in depression. So then she told me later, because of having contemplated, 
this aspect of reality. So that means that if you don't like to understand reality, it causes a problem. You see that with attachments, we expect, expect too much, too many expectations. Then when we meet reality, there's no satisfaction. Then we never find what we're looking for. That's, that's the problem with attachment. Then with anger, we, we get so annoyed, irritated with the person uh, because we only look at the faults of the person. We don't think about the qualities at that particular time. So that's kind of an aspect of not believing reality of the qualities that causes a problem with irritation and anger comes up and even a wish to harm can come. You know? So it's very sad, very destructive. That's why we call them destructive emotions. Yeah. And then, yeah, every other form of, 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 of modern kind of problems in life, anxiety, fear, depression, they very rooted in, in kind of misunderstandings and believe in those misunderstandings. And that actually causes us to suffer. So that's why the Buddha very clearly stated the importance of understanding reality. You know? And this understandable reality helps us to reduce these destructive emotions. And if you take it to a further extent and see where are all these destructive emotions rooted in, then we can see they're rooted in this concept of I am mine. And if you understand that aspect, then you can analyze if this concept or this self-deceptive thought, whatever you want to call it, if that I is really there or not, you examine it. Then you can actually see it's not really there the way it appears. And then you you be able to, to have a much more peaceful life. So to say that destructive emotions are less strong. As the Zoning Dalai Lama says, the more you contemplate this reality, ultimate reality of existence, then it looks like, if you do that a few times a day, it looks like destructive emotions or these afflictions almost don't come up. Because our destructive emotions and afflictions, you know, anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, uh, you know, uh, fear, anxiety, they, they use these kind of concrete building blocks. Me, them, us, them, my, I. You know, so they, they make very concrete building blocks, so to say. And if you understand that those concrete building blocks are not really there, then it helps a lot to, to counteract this kind of um, afflictions. So that's why if you understand the reality, we often talk about emptiness or interdependence. That reality we're talking about is that everything is interdependent, and that's why nothing can exist from its own side. You know? So that means the eye that appears when you get angry, or a strong desire or attachment comes up, uh, or, or, or fear whatsoever, when you almost fall off a building, or, or you know, imagine you're doing that, or close to that, then also a strong eye can come up. You know? Or, or when you watch, what is it these days? Euro, Euro Cup, Euro Cup, yeah. So then you can see <laughs> when, when one 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 team wins and when one team loses. You look, you look at the faces. Yeah, yeah it's kind of it's very strong. <laughs> the UK, Denmark, right? Was I think I could because here I can hear quite well. I almost know how many. Goals they have because on the other side of the road, there's a person, a few persons on the roof, they're following it. So I know exactly when it's on. <laughs> More or less, how many they score because then I can almost feel that their eye comes up and then us, UK, <laughs> and them, <laughs> Denmark. <laughs> yeah. And you can see because it was in the news also, I saw people seen read the news that that's the, the, the National anthem, you know, they were they were they were going against, you know. So that means that us and them makes it cause a kind of a problem. You see that in, in these kind of games, and, and you can see if you if you win, then the eyes boost up, and then uh, you should see the coaches sometimes. When yeah, some of the coaches they have high blood pressure. You know why? Because if they lose, they get depressed. If they win, they get too excited. <laughs> so that's also rooted in a kind of yes, either winning or losing. Yeah, goes to two complete extremes. You see that? It's very interesting to, to sometimes see the news and see oh, what the Buddha said. Is it true or not? <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. There's nothing wrong with football. 
is, yeah, some people are very excited and wants to relax. But it's just an observance that you can see that things are involved with, with, with emotions, you see? And, and that causes either a problem or not a problem. You see, that's, that's quite, it's quite clear in the news uh, that people, if you read the news, for example, out of anger, a person shoots somebody else, right? You feel like, oh. yeah. Then when you read the news about, um, there was some good news, sometimes there's some good news on, on uh, and so there was one, one American police officer who was called to a supermarket because there was one family stealing, you know, because uh, during the pandemic, stealing. And then this officer came in and saw this family with children and thought, oh, God, you know, people have difficult lives. And then he, he, he talked with a lady who actually stole quite some goods in the supermarket. And then he thought, if I put her in, 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 take her to the office, then, you know, she will suffer more. And he just decided to pay for the bill. Very interesting. So then you say, well, that's nice, right? So that means that this kind of compassion attitude is a kind of energy or something positive that brings happiness, right? So that means that uh, this, this kind of a subjective thing is sometimes quite helpful for us to relate to that. Yeah. We have scientific backup. We have backup of the Buddha saying that compassion is a virtue and anger is a non-virtue and whatever is non-virtue produces suffering, so that's why anger produces suffering and compassion produces happiness, because it's a virtue. So the Buddha didn't make this up. It's not made up by the Buddha. It's what we call the law of cause and effect relationships. Yeah? And those law of cause and effect relationships are reality. So in a similar way, you put a seed with right fertilization, heat and moisture, it goes to a sprout and plant, you know, but in our mind is very similar. You know, that's we often talk about karma is not something magical. Karma is, is quite, it's just nothing else than law of cause and effect within the continuum of a person. That's what we call karma, you know, as very complex aspects, but has also quite, quite easy understandable aspects. When the mind gets irritated with anger, that produces a kind of unpleasant mind, right? And that produces maybe some verbal abuse or some nasty words. And so, and that by itself also creates suffering for self and others. So that means that anger being non-virtue, the Buddha said, the definition of non-virtue is that which produces suffering. And so that means that that aspect of the Buddhist teaching is, is not is nothing has nothing to do with Buddhism, basically. It's just a law of reality. Yeah, we see that from a subjective point of view as well. When we get irritated or we see somebody killing somebody else, it feels very uncomfortable. It feels very unpleasant, you see? But then, if there's something good based on compassion, we automatically feel, even with animals, right? You sometimes see these pictures of a, of a tiger who's not hungry. There's one, yeah. Then there were a few antelopes chased by wolves or something like that, or, or hyenas. And then this tiger, or lion, was lion, I think, this lion, was actually saving the antelope. And then later on, when the, the wolves or, or the hyenas were being chased away, then this antelope came to the, to the lion. I just, you know, thank you. So that means it's very interesting. If you see that thing, oh, nice, right? It's kind of, all, all beings have, have, have some compassion. Right? This, this kind of innate is, this wholeness often talks about. is an innate aspect of all sentient beings, but some have developed it more than others. So even in the animal realm, you can see that a tiger or, or a lion will not kill when it's not hungry. So it's a very, animals have a very simplified structure of, 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 of cognition, very simplified emotional life, meaning there's basically not that much control, right? That's why, yeah, when whatever comes to mind, they follow it. But you can see that these types of compassion also have states of mind being present in the animal world. Yeah, so we see that here in this example. It's very interesting to see that. Yeah. So that means that there is the states of mind that are positive, the states of mind are negative. But the more the positive ones are being developed, it gives ourselves a kind of positive result as well as the animal realm. 
as well as when we see it, we feel kind of very, very, uh, yeah. And even unborn babies, once a very interesting, uh, you know, Mathieu Regard, remember Mathieu Regard? So he's quite, uh, he wrote a very interesting book on, on altruism. And he gave a presentation on that, on doing one of the Mind Alive Institute presentations in, in uh, conference or dialogues in, in Serra, in monastery one day. It's very interesting. He showed a very interesting video about, on, about newborn babies uh, who I think just a few months old. Just, just no language, no conceptualizations yet. Not too many. <laughs> so then they had kind of, they looked at a TV set and there were kind of two cartoon figures. One was very nasty and the other one was very compassionate. You know, so they look to that for, for a minute or two or three, I think. And then they show the newborns two teddy bears. And they look exactly according to the figures of the cartoon. One, the nasty one, same dress and same outfit. And the other one is kind of the, the nice one. And it was kind of the sentence of, of in the 90, I think 95, 96% of these newborn babies, they choose the teddy bear in the cartoon that was nice. You know, <laughs> so it's very interesting. I mean, it's very interesting as, as data, right? As kind of research. So that means that innate we have this goodness. Yeah. So then later in life, we we generate all kind of conceptualities, and then we go either to the extreme, right? So that means that in nature, you know, there's kind of goodness in all of us, and goodness in our minds. But it's just the matter of fact of developing that potential. That's what it is. So that's what the Buddha said is kind of these aspects of mind are there and we examine them and then we teach according to that. And the Buddha didn't make this law, but examined it well and saw, okay, this emotion causes suffering, this emotion causes happiness. Yeah. Anger causes suffering, compassion causes happiness. So then he analyzed that even more and then saw what is the real origin of all this, meaning where is compassion? How does that relate with reality? Because compassion is based upon the concern of thinking about others, right? And and self-centeredness is based upon concern about yourself. So people who are very self-centered, there's a much more inclination to to depression, low self-esteem, you know, afflictions like anger, attachment. If you meet people who are very wealthy, in India, I met quite a few. Um, quite wealthy people, um, friends of friends, um, and, and one lady, she was quite high up in, in one of the big companies. So, um, yeah. So uh, she uh, she lost a lot of money but, uh, because her her colleagues, so to say, though who were family members, they just were so so kind of grasping to to more wealth. You know? So they made a lot of problems in their company, and that's why the company completely collapsed. So she lost a lot of millions and billions, of, millions, yeah, in millions of dollars probably. But so, but she was so amazing because the, all, all the money she had left, she built a whole school, you know, very interesting. So when you meet a person like that, and it's very, very professional mind, um, so you meet a person like that, it's so nice to talk to and be around. But sometimes also you see very, or you meet very wealthy people, but they're very narrow-minded, they only think about themselves. And then you can see, just talking to them, you can see how miserable they are. You know, they don't really know how to deal with, with pain or wealth. One, one day I was on one airport, a small airport in North India, Ramchala, and one day I saw two famous people. One person was a Bollywood star, you know, not Hollywood, but in India you have Bollywood. <laughs> It's very really interesting. Yeah. Movies. That's also very interesting. Just on the side, when oh, Bollywood, yeah, and then in Karnataka there's another one uh, similar. So it's very just on the side. I'll come back to the story, but that just came to my mind another aspect that we fabricate aspects of reality that we think is reality. So once I was with a friend, few friends, in the bus from from Pushalinga to Bangalore, which is kind of quite a six six seven hours bus ride. And then in the early days, yeah, we changed the mice ago, but in this detail. So in the early days, we had the, the TV sets in the bus. So you cannot prevent yourself from, you have to see that. 
<laughs> so often we had this airplug airplug in and then try to do some reading. <laughs> the TV is quite loud, so you cannot prevent yourself from looking up to the screen sometimes, right? even in the middle of your reading or your prayers. So, and there's this kind of typical hero type, you know? We, <laughs> for them is the hero. It's like leather jacket, black color, sunglasses, black, mustache, black. And then they walk a little bit like in a particular way. So when we look at that, we think, ah, we just laughed, right? My, two of my friends and two Western monks, we just, we just thought, <laughs> like that, you know? But then a few people in the bus, hmm? <laughs> because for them it's, it's the hero. You can see it's just merely imputed by the mind. You see that? So, it's really good by so to go back to the other story that uh, Dharmshala, there was this Bollywood star lady, looks also dark, black, black dress, black sunglasses, bodyguards. Yeah. She, she looked miserable. But she was, uh, normally on the screen, they are like, like this, you know? But <laughs> if you <laughs> in private, they're sometimes slightly different. And it was quite famous because the ground force were making all the way photographs all the time. But the same day, also, this witness arrived. <laughs> it's very interesting to see the difference. It's always also a very famous person, right? But uh, it always comes out, yeah, everybody, hi. <laughs> like, completely different attitudes, you see? So that means experience happiness if you're wealthy or if you're famous or not. It depends on the mind, right? It's not, it's not depending on fame or wealth. So, so that means it depends on the mind, and we see the mental states. Uh, some are constructive and some are destructive. So, and it's all the destructive ones are all rooted in this self concern. So I am mine. Yeah. And then we see that because of this self concern, we make a distinction between me and, and the other person. Right? So that's why we have also the distinction between the person we dislike, the person we like, and the person we have indifferent feeling towards to. Yeah, we make a very clear distinction. Black and white, day and night differences. But actually, it doesn't really exist with the object as such. You see, so that means our mind fabricates a particular reality that is not really there. there. Yeah, in the quantum mechanics, they talk about the same things. It's a process rather than individual parts. And so that means that the friend, enemy, and stranger is a process of because the person says something nice to me, that's why I like this person. The other person puts out my fault or my mistake. I don't like this person. You see? So it all has to do with ego boosting or not. Not all the time, but quite often. And then based on that, we make a decision, like or dislike. But actually, the person who criticizes you is actually much kinder because he helps you to develop. You can practice patience. You can, you can change your mind because if you never know your own mistakes, you will never develop. Right? So that means the person who points out your mistakes, actually, you should do like that. <laughs> because that person helps you to correct yourself and also helps you to see the ego coming up. Because without seeing the ego coming up, you will never understand that this ego is actually the cause of the problem. And we just get angry and it happens to us. And that's kind of an emotional hijack. But if you analyze this first, this grasp into a very concrete ego or I. So a person who criticizes you actually is very, very helpful. You know, and that's, that's a bit lacking in the West. In the West, if you tease people, then people react not very positive often. <laughs> if you see his wholeness with, with other, even you know, religious leaders sometimes, taking you know, the beard, <laughs> it, it does a lot of things like that. You know, it's very interesting. So in, in, in the monastic environment, same thing. People tease each other. Just to the edge that you get angry. And then they say, Oh, well, look, you're almost getting angry now. <laughs> In the West, if you do that, it's quite difficult sometimes. But it's a very healthy approach to learn and see this, this eye. And you see His Holiness often just teasing others as well, quite often. So that it means that we train in, in what is actually the real cause of our problem, seeing the ego coming up. That's what it is. So when the ego comes up, and then we believe that's reality, then we get angry, attachment, or jealousy, or pride arises. But if this ego identity is as really there or not, that's the question. 
So that we can examine. That's the Buddha said. You should examine. Don't believe what I say. You know, you should examine if that's reality or not. So then, if you check if this I is there or not, it's kind of very interesting. Many interesting meditations of checking the body, checking the mind, and then you find something like that. And after some time, you can come to the conclusion it doesn't really exist the way it appears. And that brings it brings a lot of peace because then all your problems also become much less because there's no kind of concrete I to be found, and there's no concrete problem, or no concrete friend, enemy, or stranger. It's not really there. It's just our own fabrication. So that's why David Bohm also said, it's, it's just a show, it's not really there. So that's quite interesting to sometimes check when the person criticizes you, or when you're close to death, or you imagine you're almost dying, or, or um, you know, strong desires, strong attachments, and want to this, want to that. Then you see where is this all originated. Then it's very interesting to see that it often is rooted in a concept of I am I, which we call the view of the transitory collection. So what is that I am I, or this view of the transitory collection, is we have a collection of body and mind. We have a collection of body and mind. It's, we, know, we know we can think, we listen, we reflect, you know, we move our body sometimes. So that means there is a body and mind. You know? So then on top of this body and mind, we think there is something else, like I, so to say. So that's the question, is that really there or not? Or is it just appearance? So this is what we call ignorance in, 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 in Buddhist thought. It's kind of an I that is, looks to appear very concrete on its own side without dependence. And based on that, we, we make a distinction. We say, me and them, or we, 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 we generate strong afflictions. But it's very interesting to check if this I really exists the way it appears. Because we know from the dream that whatever appears is not reality, or being afraid of snakes or, or rats, or mice, mouse, or <laughs> you know, but yeah, sometimes here and here, sometimes see. I heard. So if you see something move, ah, like so that means that if there's something moving, if it's a small mouse, if not a rat, just a little tiny nice one, then if you're afraid of rats, you you jump, you jump up. You know? So that means that habituation to fear is you know, if you see something, you believe, oh, it's a rat, but actually it's just a tiny mouse or something like that. Or, or maybe just an imagination, right? So we often believe, or afraid of spirits, and we see a little bit movement somewhere of, of, of some wind and curtain or something, then, then it causes you to, 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 to generate fear. And so that means whatever appears to our mind is not always reality. Yeah. So in a similar way, a person you dislike, when somebody mentioned the name of that person, when you're really in a, in a state of, of really disliking this person, then when somebody calls out the name of the person, the person not really there, it's just a name. The name of this person, say person A, enters your ear, right? It's just the sound of person A. But that causes you to be completely getting disturbed by it. It's very interesting. Because the person is not there, it's just how we react actually gives ourselves a lot of suffering, you see? So that means that what appears to our mind at that time is not reality, but we think it's reality. And we relate it with a very negative picture of this person, you see? So that causes us actually to suffer. It means that all these destructive emotions are rooted in this kind of misunderstanding of reality, it is rooted in the concept of my and mine, the view of transfer collection, because on top of the body and mind, there is no inherent I to be found. It just appears like that. It is not really, really there. If you really analyze well, the body is just a process, right? If you go beyond the skin and you check what's in there, and it's just a process. And the breathing or the heartbeat or the things in the body or the mind is just, we start with a talk and now it's already one hour and some 15 minutes gone, right? And we're thinking about different things. So the mind also is just a process of individual moments. There is no concrete eye in the process to be found, right? Yeah, so it's very interesting if you just sometimes check and see 
So when somebody criticizes you, it's, it's very kind because this person helps you to change. This person helps you for the ego to come up. And it's very interesting because that's, that's kind of the research. You know, you see how the ego comes up and then you see how you react. So initially it's important to be the observer, and not get involved. So to be the observer in this case, you have to have acceptance. First you have acceptance. Acceptance of negative thoughts, acceptance of, 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 uh, of, of destructive emotions, because we're not perfect. Right? We have good qualities, everybody has good qualities, even in the animal realm, we saw. So we all have good qualities, but we have temporarily these clouds, right? So that means that if you first expect, if the first aspect is, is acceptance, and the same with death and dying, if you have acceptance, then it helps so much, you know? If you don't have acceptance, then it's very difficult. In India, some of the doctors, they will be physically harmed by family members because somebody passed away. And then they couldn't deal with this. It's not true, it's not true, it cannot be true, it cannot be true, it cannot be true. And the doctors fall, the doctors fall, the doctors fall, the doctors fall. You see? So <laughs> that means a misunderstanding of reality causes this, this, this family to harm the doctor because it's the doctor's fault. Nobody dies all by themselves. It's always somebody's fault. So that means they couldn't understand that this patient had COVID, had some other health issues, and that caused the person to die. They don't like to believe that. You see? So that means that if you don't have acceptance of that, then the mind gets really disturbed because you don't like like this. And you don't know how to relate. Same when COVID just started and we went into lockdown, there's many people, they don't have this acceptance that's possible to, to come into being and then it causes a problem. You know? It's the same when I came from Eastern Nepal, as I told you, it was very difficult to adjust within 24 hours, the, the few weeks of, of things that happened. So then not accepting that causes me a little bit to, oh, no, it cannot be true because I have to go back to India. I mean, you know, <laughs> so your mind gets completely disturbed because it doesn't like to flow with reality. So if you not flow with reality, but you go against it, then there's a problem. You know? So the first step is, is, is acceptance. You know, when uh, negative emotions come up, acceptance. Because if you have acceptance, you can take distance, right? If you can take distance, you can observe. If you don't take distance, you're involved in it. You know, your mind is occupied by this affliction. You cannot do anything. You cannot feel thinking. You can analyze. You're involved. It's like this emotional hijack, right? So you have to be from this. Oh, look, what is the problem? Same with a hijack, right? In a plane, in the early days, when there's a hijack, the hijack is in complete control, right? The, the people in the plane cannot do anything. But the forces outside, they look, okay, how many people are there in the plane? Where are they moving? So that means that the police on the, on the side is very neutral perspective. Okay, look, what's there, what's going on? And they can observe it, right? But the people in the plane, they too, like, excite, there's too much anxiety and fear. They cannot really think properly. Yeah, untrained trained mind cannot think properly. But it means if you have acceptance and understanding, the mind becomes neutral because you can take distance. Yeah, so we have destructive emotions. We're not perfect, but we can change. So the first step is the acceptance of that, the acceptance of our faults, right? And then look at them from a distance, you know? And then because of looking at it from a distance, already then the involvement becomes less. And already then you can see everything in a much clearer way. And already then the destructive emotion loses potential to take over. You see, so that's why the first step is kind of acceptance, you know? Yeah. Uh, and see, because even the destructive emotions are mind by nature, you know? So destructive emotions by nature, also there's an aspect of, of, of consciousness or clear and knowing is there, but not recognized. Yeah, there are techniques to, to, to see that it's all fluctuation of mind and then because you understand the nature of, of anger or the nature of attachment or desire or fear, they, because you understand their nature, they, then, they cannot take over, right? So the first step is to, to take distance, you know, and accept it, first step. 
then, then they lose their, their, their power to become manifest in the sense of taking control. Yeah, in, in Tibetan, we say, Shen Wang Chen means all the power to buy the power of the affliction. So here, we like we have to be in control. The first step is kind of distance, acceptance. You know, of course, we make problems and then, okay, we can make mistakes. And then you accept and then, distance. And then you analyze. Oh, look, this particular emotion came up. Anger or jealousy or pride or attachment or whatever is your worst motivate, your worst uh, emotion. Right? We walk mostly in mind trainings with the emotion that is the worst for us. Yeah, so then you see, okay, look at it. And then you analyze, what did it do to my mind? Yeah, so if you have a neutral perspective, you can analyze. Look, it disturbed my mind. I said something wrong because of that. Then I regretted that I said something wrong. So you can see that one moment, or let's say a few minutes, of a destructive emotion like anger actually can cause a whole snowball effect of, 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 of disturbances from your own mind and from the mind of others. So if you observe that from a distance, then you say, oh, oh look at this. And then you start to be convinced of not following this or not triggering that your mind making the same mistake and, and believing this. So sometimes talking to yourself is also quite helpful. I do it sometimes. So <laughs> really, when the mind is a bit negative, something like that, I cheer myself up and then it breaks me out of the cycle and then look back and say, oh, okay. <laughs> so that helps us to, uh, there's nothing wrong with that because it helps us to, you know, to take distance from a particular emotional strain. You know? And if you can take distance, you have a much better insight in the process and you can control your mind much better. You know? Because we all have this potential of, of, of the nature of the mind. So we can stay calm. If you don't take this step backwards, then you get involved and it's too late. You know? So that means the first step is acceptance. Then we, we analyze the faults of, of the emotion and see, okay, what does it do to me? This, this, I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's easier said than done, but over time, if you do it well, you will recognize more. Then you were able to take more distance because of this acceptance. Then you were able to slowly transform your mind and see this is not very constructive. You know? So that means you learn what these emotions do to you and if you want to follow it or not. Yeah, and then the mind becomes stronger because of distance is there to separate you from it, you see? Yeah, so that's kind of a technique to be done. And then with, with the root of all this is this I. You know, just sometimes see when somebody criticizes you, instead of reacting straight away, just take a deep breath and you're just, hmm, look how I react. <laughs> just look, look into the mind, it's very interesting, you know? Because you see irritation coming, and if you still have this acceptance and you keep distance, it's a very interesting process. And sometimes you can just laugh about it. And if you laugh about it, the emotion loses its potential, right? Because you see, oh, it is very sneaky. It's coming there from the corner, and now it's almost become more manifest and wants to take over, but I'm not following in the same trap anymore. <laughs> so it's very interesting over time, especially when you see how this eye appears, especially just before these destructive emotions arise. The more you tackle that one, then these destructive emotions will lose their potential. It's very interesting. That's why this only says, if you think about emptiness or interdependence or these aspects of reality that is just a process uh, on a regular basis, then this I will not come up that strongly. When the I doesn't come up that strongly, this ego boost doesn't come up that strongly, then these destructive emotions, they will lose their potential. So it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there's just a few things about compassion and reality because the more you understand the mind in that way and you see there is no ego as such, then you start to relate with others much better than before. And then compassion becomes a natural flow. And then when you have more compassion for others, that will help you also to, to, to eliminate the self cherishing attitude. Yeah, there is a cause for many problems. So it's a very interesting con connected process. And even those who study a little bit more, they also know if you re if you realize emptiness, then compassion becomes stronger. And and uh, because if you understand ultimate nature of reality, you see the interconnectedness, and you see the cause of the problem, and you see how to solve the problem. 
So that's why the more you understand emptiness, actually, compassion becomes stronger. Okay? So that's, uh, yeah, that's a little bit of what I was planning to talk about today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your interest. If there's any questions regarding these points, then we still have a few minutes. Depends on which clock I'm looking here. 54, minus 28, minus 26. Yeah. So time also is <laughs> time is also relative, you see. Depends on why you watch. Sometimes we had once we had two computers here in the hall, and I thought that can be true. The computers should be exactly the same, right? Because it's internet connected, but it was not. <laughs> yeah. So your yeah, time is also relative. Yeah. If there's any questions, then we can do it. Um I have one for you, Geshela, um, from Milena, and she, she asks, is the eye a memory? If the eye is a memory? Yes. We have memories of the eye, but memory is different. Memory is a state of mind, remembering things, right? And the eye is an appearance. So how the eye appears to you when you get angry or when you get strong desire or when there's fear, that eye appears, right? But the eye is not the mind to which it appears. So there's a mind and there's something that appears to the mind. Okay? So that appearance can be remembered. Okay? So that's a few different things there. Okay? So the eye appears you know, in a particular way. There's a very strong eye, you think. But there's a mind that, to which it appears, right? And that can, be mem that can be remembered. So later on, we can remember when somebody criticized you, how did I appear? Okay. But what we remember is two things there. We remember how it appeared and remember the mind to which it appears. Right? So the same thing in, when you ask your question, did you see John yesterday? You said, yes, I saw John yesterday. So then you remember seeing John and John. You see, yeah, yesterday you saw John. So you remember John as well as seeing John. So here also, when you remember how the eye appears, there's two aspects there. You remember the appearance and you remember the consciousness to which it appears, right? You say, oh yes, I was in this state of mind and this appeared to the mind. So I remember that appearance or I, have, I remember uh, I was in that state or that kind of, yeah, mind so to say. Yeah, so a few things to that. Um, we have one more Geshler from Rachel who asks, how does one stop taking things personally? How does one stop things? How does one stop taking things personally? Personally, Ale, how do you stop that? You're not from one day to the other day, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, you know, often when somebody says something, and then we think, oh, this person said this because of this because of this to harm me or because of this to do that to me. You know? So we take often things personally. So the, to avoid that, the best thing to do is whatever you do in daily life, yeah, uh, you try to have a good motivation, especially with some major decisions that can be taken personally. <laughs> so you, you generate correct motivation and then you do something, an act or, or whatever you, you have to do. Then with a good motivation, you do your best, right? So you do your best with a good motivation and you do it. Then maybe it doesn't come out well and somebody thinks it's your fault. Yeah, and then gives you a comment about it. Yeah. <laughs> so then you should think, okay, I, you know, I tried, I had a good motivation. I tried my best, but it didn't work out. So, so what? You know? So that means you don't have to take it personally because you know, you did it correctly in your position, the best way you could do it, right? So that you don't have to take personally because you're convinced for yourself, it's clear, okay, I had a good motivation, I tried to do my best, but it didn't work out. So don't take it personally. Right? So that helps a lot because often, um, and if we really make a mistake, right? If we do something wrong, we didn't motivate ourselves properly, it also happens, right? Sometimes we're not always perfect in that regard. So we make a mistake and then, you know, we, we maybe harm somebody or whatsoever. And then also what we should do is take it personally, but not in a harmful way. Meaning, okay, I made this mistake. It's not good. It's not correct. I shouldn't do this. And you apologize to the person. 
or if you force you yourself and you think to yourself, okay, come on, this is not correct, you shouldn't do this. Yeah. Then that's it. That means that you don't have to worry about it too much anymore. You think I did something wrong, this is the reason, it's harm myself, it harm somebody else, that's it. I'm gonna to try to do it not again in the future. And you think about it in that way. And it's very constructive. Then you don't have to take things personally anymore because you already made a decision. You're gonna do better in the future, right? So then it means it's, it's constructive moving forward. Yeah, so then think, well, I'm a bad person. I do this all the time. That's, that's, that's a destructive emotion by itself. So that means that when you make a mistake, we, we, we often call the confessing the four opponent powers, for example, it's very constructive. It not, has nothing to do with guilt or, or, or shame or, or whatsoever. It's kind of, okay, I did something wrong. We all make mistakes. Uh, this I did wrong because of this, because of this, because of that. I harmed somebody. I shouldn't do that. I apologize. And then I'm trying to do better. That's it. Plus, in India, we say katam means finished. Yeah. So then you stop worrying and worrying about it because worrying more about it is not going to make, make the issue better. Right? So you construct a way forward is okay, I acknowledge the mistake and I'm trying to do better. And you can make a strong, strong prayer or intention to at least try, you know, because that's the best way you can do. And then it's a very constructive way forward. And then you don't get entangled in the worry again and again and again and again. Past is past, move forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, Cesar? That's it? Well, there is another question, but I'm not sure with, if we have enough time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, one more. Um, can you explain a bit more about which strategies can we apply to develop acceptance? Ali. That's from Christina. Yeah. Acceptance meaning that, you know, if you understand a little bit more about our samsaric existence, and impermanence, that nothing is fixed, you know, that you can get sick any mo moment, another person can get sick any moment, and sometimes you die of the sickness, sometimes you don't, sometimes you have a difficult period in time, and then you think, why me, why now, I don't want to be sick now, right? So <laughs> then if you understand a little bit more about the nature of impermanence and the nature of cause and effect relations, then you also start to understand that sometimes we get negative. Sometimes our mind gets, gets depressed, so sometimes we get sick. That's the nature of our life, right? So if you understand that and not worrying about it too much, then you also know it's just temporary. So if you think it's only temporary and it's there because it's based on cause and effect beyond my control at a particular time, then also acceptance becomes easier because acceptance is based on misunderstanding. Why me? Why now? Right, so it's a, based on a misunderstanding of reality. But we know we're not perfect, other people are not perfect, so there are problems coming and going. That's the nature of our existence. We thought with the pandemic we have everything under control, and within you know a few weeks the whole world was upside down. Right, so that means that that is the nature of reality. That is the nature of our existence on this planet. So that means if you understand that aspect, you're open to, to acceptance. You know? that everything can change all the time. We can get sick, we can get depressed, we can lose a person, we can lose ourselves one day. So that means that um, if you understand this, this fluctuation in our lives, then acceptance becomes easier, right? That, that things can go in different directions because everything is dependent on cause and conditions, nothing is fixed. So if you understand that, then acceptance is much easier. And then when things happen, but I said with my mother, then because I haven't contemplated this, then when my father passed away, there was sadness, but she didn't go into the extreme of a depression right? because she understood that this is possible in life, right? So that understanding of reality helps a lot in acceptance, you know? Yeah. So thinking everything is just a cause and effect relationships, nothing is fixed, and it depends on many causes and conditions and that can bring all kinds of problems or happiness, right? Yeah. Yeah, it takes, it takes quite some time to contemplate this in order to have a little bit more, uh, you know, acceptance. Because I was in retreat in Eastern Nepal for a few weeks, <laughs> tried to contemplate many years. 
<laughs> but then still, when it all happened, it was like, oh, 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 and I didn't like to believe it initially, right? So I didn't like to accept initially, but then because of tired, so the trip and everything, so it's like for fun, and I think, okay, look, you know, okay, yes, okay, but then, yeah, over time it comes, right? Yeah. So yeah, this is a matter of time to, to contemplate this point. Yeah. Yeah, hope it helps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that is okay. Thank you so much. Then, uh, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I really wish I could go. Maybe later I can come to the beautiful area of Somerset. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much for inviting and organizing. Lynn and uh, Sandra and others. And then, uh, yeah, maybe we just dedicate, maybe just with a prayer that we, what we have learned today, try to put into practice the best way we can and to, um, um, best way we can and to generate the realizations, so to say, of, of understanding acceptance and understanding uh, destructive emotions and the root of all this, and to, to go against it in the sense of transforming this whole process with, with like uh, the minds of bodhicitta. Yeah, no need, Mandala. Yeah, maybe just do the two bodhicittas you can find down the page. You put two bodhicittas down. Yeah, and a little bit more down. Yeah, this is in the last last two verses. Maybe. Oh yeah, we can do all three. All four. Yeah, okay. So dedicate for the spreading of these teachings in all directions. Long life for Sorin Zai Lama. Thomas Obri Mushe and then two Borchidas. And Agi Jinas Abu Gewa the ten down go work in the number. Yeba just no lozan drapa y timbi nimbu ring do sell jiju. Are rawe for ways in down so ten down dewa male jungu. Share is a one thing, sing yats of shape, shit, and body, and you do some jay and yarn, Bone on the bell was your donny. How are they going? My dear Panan, you give by number me by Bone on the bell was your donny. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain on truth, to remain to dispel the suffering in the greater things. May the king of Dharma, some couple's way of Dharma practice flores, and may the omen souls be pacified and hold on Joseph on the circumstance completeness. To the power of having made single point of request to you, Lord Chapra, may all unfortunate manifestations of degenerated age, illness, famine, falling, epidemic diseases, and our spirits and the fears and support pacify and excellent protection of the Please bless me that all the wishes be complete. By invoking the power of love and kindness, the compassion of Teresa, to the force of making extensive prayers, may all sickness, war, fighting, famine be completely pacified so that beings have long, have healthy and happy lives. May the glorious Guru's life long and stable, may all beings sustain spirit of happiness. And may I and others, without exception, commit merit to divine activities, and may we quickly to bless and quickly. Jewa Gunda Yanda Lama Dam Dami Chigi Bala Loji Sadan Lamgi Yunda Rabzo Ni Doji Changi Oba. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, see you next time or tomorrow, something like that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you. Priscilla, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to come along tomorrow, um, three o'clock till six o'clock, um, going in greater depth. Thank you, Geshela. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Good night. Good dreams. Don't believe it.